Good morning. We're so glad everybody's with us this morning and uh, one more week here where we are virtual, but we have some really good news to start service this morning. Uh, we have uh, met and talked about it and debated and thought about it and prayed about it and decided that we are going to come back uh, to in-person services, plus we will additionally have our virtual service available starting on February 7th. Now, we'll have more details in the next week about how that'll work, and of course we will have masks and temperature checks but we do want to begin to have people come back to the building. We had decided we were going to try and uh, follow the counsel of our local school districts. And as our local school districts have begun to bring students back uh, to their buildings, we are going to try to bring folks back here as well. We certainly uh, are so grateful for the, the technology that's been available to us and the uh, skilled people. We've got uh, Trey and Ryan and Chuck back there today who are making this happen week after week, uh, but we also really believe that it is important for us to be together in person as much as we possibly can. So we believe on February 7th we can begin the process of returning, uh, and we're going to do everything we can to make that as safe as possible and enjoyable as possible. So we'll have some more details this week, but we hope that you will plan to join us uh, in, in the building again starting February 7th. We have some sad news and uh, um, about Jim Hawkins' father, who has been at home on hospice. He did pass away uh, last night, and there'll be more details about that, but keep Jim and Tammy in your prayers. Uh, we also want to let you know that Lori Colburn's family, Lori passed away this last week after a long battle uh, with... Um, brain cancer and uh, her celebration of life service is going to be Sunday, February 7th at 1.30 p.m. at Christian Fellowship Church and everyone is invited. Uh, Janet Bloomingberg's mom, Carol Stevens, uh, was hospitalized with COVID and um, she has beaten COVID, but she is now um, moving to rehab for recovery and uh, physical therapy due to her Parkinson's, which the COVID really uh, set her back on that. So please pray for her husband, Wayne, and for Janet and for their family, as they, and for Carol, of course, as they deal with this. Uh, Gerald Merritt is the uncle of Angel and Michaela Overcast. And Gerald's uncle, uh, Gerald passed away this week with COVID. So please pray as well for Angel and Michaela and their whole family. We're going to have a special time of prayer in just a moment. We know there have been so many who have either uh, lost somebody recently or those who have um, suffered, those who have struggled, uh, people who have um, people who have had uh, grief and health crises. And so we're going to have a special time of prayer for those people in just a moment. Gene's going to come up here in just a moment and lead us in that. So uh, we have emailed out a list, a prayer list of people that we're going to be praying for. And if you have that with you, uh, if you were able to print that out from your email or if you're able to print that really quick, we will also have the names of the folks we're praying for on screen. Uh, this would be a good thing. We would ask if you're able to uh, pray through that all week this week for these people. We know this has been a difficult time and there's nothing, if you're one of the people who uh, is uh, on this list, you've lost somebody, uh, you have somebody in a health crisis, we want you to know that we, we want nothing more than to be putting our arms around you, to be walking with you, to be crying with you in this time. And uh, we're, we're so sorry that uh, you're, you're struggling in, in this time especially. And so we want you to know that our hearts and our prayers and our love is with you. And we encourage our whole body to uh, reach out and send cards and notes and texts to these people and let them know that you care. Uh, as we go forward after Gene's prayer with the service, we'll be looking at Hebrews 10 in Words of Grace. I hope that you've been following along and doing the Words of Grace devotionals together with your family, reading the chapters, reading the devotionals. I hope that for our teenagers that they've been participating as part of the reading, uh, Bible reading challenge. I know that so far it's just been phenomenal. The response has been awesome. So stick with it, and we're going to have a great dialogue about Hebrews 10 this morning. All right, Gene, if you'd come on up here, I'm going to hand it over to him to lead us in prayer for these who have been hurting. O Holy Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Sovereign Lord, our Creator, who holds the universe in the palm of His hands, we cry out to you in the midst of our grief as so many of us have been touched by the deaths of loved ones we hold so dearly. Death has taken away our mothers, fathers, 
grandmothers, grandfathers, husbands, wives, aunts, and uncles. We have been tormented by this pandemic that has torn out our hearts and left an empty hole that can never be filled. Lord, I cry out to you not only on behalf of my mother, Jewel Gilliland, but also for the families of Bob Gilbert, Ann Gill, B.J. Summers, Don Neestrath, and Lori Colburn. Lori's death particularly has hit so many of us so hard as she was so young, leaving Chad and their precious young children. We pray not only for them, but for Richard and Melinda as they do their best to fill the chasm left by Lori's passing. Give them all strength, Holy Father. We also pray for the families of Ernie Flowers, Joni Goodman's grandfather, Edwin Parham, Kathy Johnson's dad, LaRue Goldman, Adam Cooper's grandmother, Laura McDougall, Linda King's mom, Donna Nunn, Deb Thompson's aunt, Gerald Merritt, Angel, and Michaela's uncle, and as we just learned, Bill Hawkins, Jim's dad. Lord, we're comforted by the image you have left in Scripture that describes death as a sleep. That pictures the beggar Lazarus being carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom to be comforted there. Oh God, we pray for their comfort and for ours. We look forward to our time in glory with you, O Lord, when you promise to wipe every tear from our eyes. And when there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. When we will be gathered with all the saints who have gone before. However, in the meantime, Holy Father, we continue to pray for our family members who are sick and suffering. Whether it be from this accursed virus or some other illness that plagues our fallen world. We pray for Jim and Sandra Sims that many... So many of us know and love so dearly. We pray for Glenda Mason, Cheryl Goodman's mom, who is doing better and now home with home health. And Wayne and Carol Stevens, Janet Bloomingberg's parents, who seem to have kicked COVID-19 but has set Carol's Parkinson's disease back. We pray for their continued recovery and strength. And as many of us have been touched by the suffering and death of our loved ones, Holy Father, may we be sensitive to those around us who are hurting as well. May we be an instrument of your blessing to those around us. To you be the honor and glory forever and ever. For it is in the precious name of Jesus that we Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for everything that you have given us. Although we deserve nothing, you have given us everything. Teach us to be like you who obeyed the Father, but also did so without complaint. Give us your attitude of humility and thankful acceptance. Thank you for giving us a country where we are free to worship you. Thank you for the hope that you have given to all of us this week following the week of fear we experienced in the, during the attack on democracy. Thank you for allowing us a time in our lives where a woman of color is, a, is now the Vice President of the United States. And thank you for Miss Amanda Gorman, who spoke of hope and light and put a smile on all of our faces this week. To quote Miss Gorman, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together victorious. Thank you for all that you have done for us and thank you for all that you will continue to do. Let us be grateful for that. In your name I pray, amen. For those of us that grew up in church, a lot of us went to VBS and sang songs like Father Abraham which is a great, fun kid song about how we're the children of Abraham, the sons and daughters of Abraham. But you know, we're not. See, there's a disconnect because for so many of us, we realize, hey, we aren't Jewish. We're not the descendants of Abraham. We were adopted into God's family. We were grafted into the tree. 
but we weren't part of the chosen people. And so I think it's hard for some of us to understand for the Jews at the time of Jesus, who had only known one way to worship God their entire lives, to understand that that way was going away, that it was gone, that it was done away with, and instead there's Jesus. So I'm standing here in this field today to try and help us get an idea for the massive scale of a paradigm shift that it was to worship Jesus. I just want you to imagine the temple rising from the earth in all of its grandeur, in all of its glory, a huge, magnificent building laid over with gold and with pillars and with courtyards, priests walking back and forth doing their duties day and night, trumpets blowing to call people to worship, altars burning with sacrifices, smoke rising, incense in the air. And this is going to go away. You know, God is majestic. God is big. God is huge. It seems befitting that he would have this grand, beautiful temple as a place to approach and worship him. But instead of a temple, what we find is a person. Jesus. God incarnate. God in flesh. And so the writer of Hebrews, he writes, the law is only a shadow of the good things to come. The same sacrifices repeated every year could never actually please God. It could never draw people near to God. It was like seeing somebody coming around the corner and you see the shadow first, but then the person steps out. I think in my own life, I sometimes struggle with this idea that God is at a place, that he's at a building, that, that he's in a gathering, that he's in a ritual. But you see, just like the Jews didn't need the temple because Christ superseded the temple, the church doesn't need a building. The church doesn't need a gathering. It doesn't even need our rituals. Wherever two or three are gathered, I am there. People are persecuted around the world for being Christians and they meet in homes. They huddle in prison cells. They gather in ditches by the side of the road with their heads covered because they know that there's mobs of marauding people coming to kill them. And even in those places, Christ is there. His kingdom is eternal. We are part of something bigger, better, broader, and wider than a temple ever could have been. We're part of the kingdom of God. Good morning. I'd like to read this morning from Hebrew 4, verses 12 through 16. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace and confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I appreciate so much Brian's announcement a few minutes ago that we will begin meeting again live here at the building, those who would like to, as well as continue our uh, virtual meetings. I, I feel compelled to say something. Brian did a fine job with the announcement, but sometimes uh, it seems like people want to know, well, Terrell, what do you think? Well, I think what Brian just announced, 
These are very difficult decisions to make. We know we have people who want to be here at the building, and we have others who do not need to be here at the building, but need to be uh, at home, uh, isolated, definitely socially distanced as much as possible. So these are complicated decisions uh, that, that don't come very easily. And we just want to encourage you to participate at the level that you feel you can be safe. You should not do anything that you feel you would be unsafe at participating in. So if you come here to our buildings, uh, we're going to uh, continue uh, with the distancing, uh, wearing masks, checking temperatures, and uh, asking that we not hang around and visit very long. Uh, but rather that we move on and get back to our homes. It's, it's not the fellowship that we want, but it's the fellowship that we feel like we uh, need to have for some of us at this point. And we will be keeping an eye on what's going on as far as the numbers uh, regarding the coronavirus. We'll continue getting information that we need to get. And we may adjust again and again and again before this is over with. So nothing we do is in concrete, remains instead rather fluid from one week to the next. Let's pray for the health of everyone here in our church family, but also for uh, the community and the nation as a whole. Do you like do-overs? Do-overs are kind of sweet, especially a do-over that doesn't cost you anything. No pain, no loss, no worries. Last year, Teresa and I taught two of our grandkids, the oldest two, how to play spades. Now, if you know me, you know that I'm a guy who likes to play by the rules. It's only if you play by the rules that you have a basis for a game so that everybody knows where the boundaries are. So even my darling little grandkids, whom I love with all of my heart and would gladly die for, well, they need to know rules are rules, right? It's the only way you can have a game. You've got to play by the rules. The game is fair only if everyone plays by the rules and if the rules apply equally to everyone. Well, I'm not that hard with my grandkids. You see, sometimes as we experience a violation of the rule, we can only understand how the rules apply if we actually experience a failure with the rules. So you get extra grace when you're learning how to play spades. We give do-overs. Everybody needs a little space to learn. But there are some do-overs I'd rather not do over. Shaving, for example. Little boys watch their dads shave and can hardly wait for the day to come when they will shave too. They may even play a little bit with the shave cream as they're growing up. But do you know any adult male who loves to shave so much that they get up pumped up about having to shave? It gets to be old and monotonous. How many times we've wished we could put in that brand new, sharp, five-bladed cartridge and get a close shave that lasts forever. <laughs> Never have to do that again. But no, you know, give it a few hours by four or five o'clock today. I'm going to begin feeling the stubble. And no matter how well I shaved this morning, I'll have to do it again. Mowing grass is a lot like that as well. We put out our grass seed in the fall, September, maybe October, along with some fertilizer and lime. We watch the grass turn brown in the winter. Then along about March, we begin seeing some fresh life. And in April, up it comes with all of that energy that it's been reserving and storing pushes that new fescue right out of the ground and it looks fresh and green and full of life. We cut it at our preferred height. We get the stripes crisscrossing to give it that professional manicured appearance. 
We stand back and we admire it. And we love it when our neighbors may say something. Just imagine as they brag on that lawn. We should enjoy it. Because in about a week or less, we'll have to do it again. And again. And again. And it seems we're always in a rush when we get to that point that it's time to mow the lawn again. You have to work hard to work it into your schedule. The lawn's beautiful look depends upon constant mowing. I like my truck or my car to be clean. Notice I didn't say Teresa's van. We wash it, we wax it, we polish it, we spend a day putting on a shine that is showroom perfect. And it's rewarding when you do that. I did that just a few weeks ago. And it really looked good for a few days. Hunting season kicked in. And my truck got filthy. I was a little embarrassed. It looked so bad with dirt and mud from three states that had collected on it. So I washed it only to have Teresa point out that it was going to rain the next day. That's just kind of the way it goes when we wash vehicles, isn't it? We can predict the weather, wash your car, it's going to rain the next day. And it will get dirty again and again and again. And you just have to keep doing it over. And I'm just really getting started with examples. There's so many things that we could talk about that have to be done again and again and again. Like a nine-year-old boy who smells more like a wet puppy than a human, yet doesn't want to waste his time taking a bath. Or putting dishes in the dishwasher only to have to take them out again so that you can use them and then put them back in the dishwasher. Why do we even have cabinets for dishes? I've intentionally piled on the examples and many more I'm sure you could think of. I decided to push this point a little bit to the point that you might begin to say to yourself or at least begin to feel, okay, preacher, I think I've got the point. We grow a bit weary of doing the same things over and over again when it seems like the results just don't last. When it seems like it doesn't do any good to keep on doing it. Well, if you're to that point, that's where I wanted you to be. And if you're not to that point, well, use your imagination. Come up with some more examples. It means if you're to that point, though, you're ready to hear what the author of Hebrews wanted you to hear in chapter 10. It seems like there are so many things in life that have to be done again and again and again. And it isn't always a lot of fun. Sometimes it's monotonous, frustrating, aggravating, and discouraging. But there is one do-over that neither you nor I nor anyone else will ever have to do again. And that one do-over that we'll never have to repeat is because it was done perfectly the first time that it was done and the last time it will ever have to be done. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ was perfect and do-overs are not only not required, they're not needed. And it would even be a waste to attempt to repeat them. They're not even acceptable because his perfect sacrifice was enough. Listen to the preacher in chapter 10 of Hebrews, the first 18 verses where I've kind of summarized the reading here. The law, begins the preacher, can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year after century, I added that part, make perfect those who draw near to worship. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands 
and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, referring to Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. He adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Did you notice that Jesus' sacrifice of his own body was described as once for all? Just saying a simple once wasn't enough for the preacher. He emphasizes it by saying once for all sacrifice. The preacher likes that phrase, once for all. In chapter 7, verse 27, he put it this way about Jesus, our high priest. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself his own life his own body's sacrifice was enough for all time. But the preacher likes that phrase, once for all, so much he, he wants it to ring in our ears when we think about the price Jesus paid. So in chapter 9, verse 12, Jesus did not enter by the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all. By his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The Greek word translated once for all is only applied in reference to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Some things may be done once, but Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. Now we've got some heavy theology that we've looked at in this We've got the Old Testament sacrificial system and the law and the value of sacrifices and so much more. But, but what was the practical side of this? Well, the preacher, beginning in chapter 10 and verse 19 of Hebrews, goes into the practical side of why this once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus is so important. Some of the readers of Hebrews, some of those listening to this sermon, believers who were growing discouraged had begun to shrink back, to give up, to lose hope, and they were turning away from their faith. They no longer saw the value of simple yet very critical faith and discipleship practices like assembling together. They had found every reason imaginable to keep them from gathering together with one another. Now, some of their reasons were pretty serious. But the point the writer wanted them to understand is assembling is important. The author wanted them to remember some things by way of application, beginning in verse 19 through 22. Therefore... Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We may have to keep shaving. We may have to keep mowing grass. We may have to keep washing our car. And little boys may have to keep taking baths. But we do not 
have to keep cleaning ourselves in order to enter the holy sanctuary of God. Because that way has been opened once for all. We've been washed once for all. We've been made clean once for all. And God invites all his children into his presence. Jesus opened the way for us and it will never be closed to those who do not give up hope. To those who maintain their faith and continue with their discipleship practices. The blood of Jesus opened a new and living way into the throne room of God. And we can draw near to God with full assurance that because we are his children and have been washed, we have the right by the sacrifice of Jesus to be there. An invitation to come right in and the blessing of the assurance that comes with that. Imagine the door of the personal residence of God. It has been pushed wide open so that you and I are welcomed into the very throne room of God because of the powerful sacrifice of Jesus. That door remains open. One place we experience being before the throne of God is in our worship assemblies where we find encouragement to persevere during difficult times. Verse 35, we have a warning and a blessing in Hebrews chapter 10. Very simply, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Believers have the confidence that our relationship with God is solid. It is secure. It is not flimsy. It is not shakable. It stands forever as an opportunity for you and I with confidence to approach God. Let's not throw that away. Let's not get rid of the confidence, the boldness, the grand invitation to walk right up to our Heavenly Father in much the same way that a child will walk right up to his mom or dad with confidence that they are welcomed and blessed. Confidence is another word the preacher in Hebrews likes. In chapter 3 and verse 6, he tells us that we are God's house if we hold on to confidence. And that word confidence isn't just confidence. Some translations translate it boldness. Imagine that. Our confidence is so strong that we can walk right into the house of God, right up to the throne of God, and with boldness, we can act as if we have the right to be there because we do. Due to the sacrifice of Jesus, the once for all sacrifice that opened the door to God's house. In chapter 4, verse 16, the preacher says that we can approach God's great throne of grace with confidence that we'll receive it. So this throne that we approach, it's a throne of grace. It's a throne of forgiveness. It's a throne that recognizes we have our problems. We have our weaknesses. We make our mistakes. But we know that it is our loving Father who sits on that throne. And he is there freely pouring his grace over us again and again and again so that the perfect sacrifice of Jesus keeps us clean in his presence. And then in chapter 10, verse 35, the preacher says that our confidence in our status as once for all children of God is something we should hang on to at all costs. And then finally, verse 36 in chapter 10, you need to persevere so that what you have, once you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. The only thing between us and the realization of the promises of God is our perseverance, that we hang in there. God has made promises we don't want to miss, promises that keep the throne room open, 
because we are God's house. Chapter 3 and verse 6 says, we are God's house. God's throne room is located deep within our hearts. So much so that we can't miss out on those promises because the promises are already there, sealed deeply within our hearts. While it's true that Jesus' sacrifice has flung open the door of God's throne room, never to be closed to his children, it's also true that we're not forced into God's presence. And we're allowed to choose other rooms if we want to. But why would we want to? So the author of Hebrews wants to put within us in his sermon this passion that we'll see who we are, what room where God sits on his throne we're invited into, and that we will never, never lose confidence that we have the right to be there and give up the privileges that go along with it. We do not need to do over and over again the kinds of sacrifices the law required by the offering of the blood of bulls and goats over and over and over and over again. The preacher underscores this in a way that will make perfect sense through to us through the use of two contrasting verbs in verses 11 and 12. He says the Old Testament priests stand or stood day after day, after week, after month, after year, after century. Sacrificing, keeping the fires alive, burning the sacrifices. You get anywhere close to the temple and you could smell those sacrifices that were being burnt. And the Old Testament priest stood because they were on duty. They couldn't sit. Their duty always was in progress. But not Jesus. He offered himself and then he sat down because his work was done. He sat at the right hand of the Almighty Father and in heaven setting at the Father's right hand because he doesn't have to stand and offer those sacrifices again and again and again. You see, the work Jesus did is over. It's complete. It's full. It's perfect. It's once for all. Not one animal sacrifice could have done the job even once. Not even a million Animal sacrifices had the power to remove even one sin. And yet they were offered day after day after day. Jesus' sacrifice and power in his baptismal waters that we experienced when we put on Christ in our baptisms were such that our hearts were cleaned up, our bodies were washed, our guilt was removed, and the pure water now float over our bodies. The eternal sacrifice of Jesus is enough for us to be and forever remain children of God. So the next time you wash your car, you mow your grass, or you shave, be sure to remember to offer God a a word of praise and thanksgiving that has forever made possible Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, his once for all perfect sacrifice, that you and I do not have to continue in meaningless repetitions that have no power. I'd love for you to send me a text, a word of praise or thanksgiving, if you've been moved to appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus. Maybe a word of praise to God for having the throne room open. Maybe a word of praise to Jesus and gratitude to Jesus that he's made this possible. Or you can feel free to text me about some other matter if you like. And in a few minutes, minutes, we'll try to share those together. Thank you very much. What will build? Plans for our together future by Oliver Jeffers. 
What shall we build, you and I? Let's gather all our tools for a start. For putting together and taking apart. Let's build a door where there was none. We'll build a house to be our home. I'll build your future and you'll build mine. We'll build a watch to keep our time. We'll build some love to set aside and build a hole where we can hide. A fortress to keep our enemies out and higher walls for when they shout. But you don't always lose and you don't always win. So we'll build a gate to let them in. We'll build a table to drink our tea and say, I'm sorry, me too, me three. We'll build a tower to watch the sky and other worlds that pass us by. Let's build a tunnel to anywhere. Let's build a road up to the moon. Let's build a comfy place to rest for we'll be tired soon. Let's build a boat that can't be broken, that will not sink or be cracked open. A place to stay when all is lost to keep the things we love the most. We'll put these favorite things beside the earlier love we set aside. I think that we may want them later when times are hard and needs are greater. But first things first, let's build a fire for we've planned a lot and now we're tired. It'll keep us warm like when we're born. Then we'll say goodnight as all's all right. These are the things we'll build, you and I. Good morning, church. Hebrews 10 gives us the great news that Jesus is our one and only sacrifice. But there's also other great news here. Jesus lets us know that because of that sacrifice, we have this confidence that we can accomplish our goals, that we can do the good work that is left for us to do. And the good news is that we don't have to do that alone. We get the opportunity to do that with other people who love Jesus. We can do that with our parents, with our friends, with our family, and with our church. And that is good news. We get to dream together and build together. We get to go forward into the world to create and dream and make wonderful things happen. And my work and your work gets added together to create what we couldn't have done alone. And this book beautifully illustrates that together is so much better than apart. Um, our dreams are bigger and we're called to better things. That when the little girl's anger wants to build the wall, that her dad's knowledge and experience tells her that opening a gate will be good. And so as we think about these words this week, let's remember that because of Jesus, we can go forward with confidence together. Hello, church. I'm Don Crocker, and this is my wife, Martha. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus and his disciples gathered in the upper room of a house in Jerusalem. There they shared what would be his last meal with his disciples before the crucifixion. This event we call the Lord's Supper is reported in all four Gospels. However, a detailed description is in 1 Corinthians 11. 
And I'll be reading uh, verse 23 through 26. And, and uh, Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We all look forward to the day when he comes. And I also look forward to the day when we're all able to meet together and uh, have the Lord's Supper together. Well, what I remember about Jesus today is the new commandment Jesus gave his disciples that night. It's recorded in John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us your son to be sacrificed on the cross for the redemption of our sins and to give us everlasting life. Thank you, Jesus, for the <clears throat> great sacrifice you received, you became, as you became our Passover lamb. We ask you to continue to bless our lives as we go through our pandemic and our social unrest, and that we can always remember how much you love us and then love each one another with that same love. In Jesus' name, amen. A few days ago, my son and I were talking. I don't really remember what we were talking about specifically, but I do remember one of the things that came out of the conversation. His statement was something that probably will be a shock to some of you because I think he characterized me correctly, but I feel like the average person may not characterize me quite as correctly. He said, well, Dad, you're really not a perfectionist. And he's right. I'm really not a perfectionist. Um, problem is, when I do something, I do like for it to be done right. I like to have the time to do it. But things that don't have to be done perfectly really don't always matter a lot to me. Because perfectionism is something that I appreciate. I like seeing a well-run basketball team. I like seeing a plan come together in a really good way but I'm not a perfectionist. And I can't be perfect. In a performance-based system, there's really no hope for a perfectionist. And yet, when it comes to my walk with our Lord, I'm more of a perfectionist there than I am anywhere because I recognize how inadequate my performance is. But what the sacrifice of Jesus does is remove completely and forever in his once-for-all sacrifice a performance-based religion where you have to get it right and there is no room for error. The only way any of us will ever, if you understand at all what I'm saying this moment, the only way we will ever be able to get it right would actually be when we die, when we're not breathing, when we're not doing something. Because if we're breathing, if we're doing something, we will get something wrong. We will lose our temper. We'll let a word slip. We'll have a thought. We'll make a mistake. We'll treat somebody incorrectly. We will just do that. But Jesus, once for all, sacrifice says, performance-based religion is gone. It is dead. Religion is not, or faith in God, or my walk with God, is not based on performance that is perfect. It is based on performance that's passionate about Jesus, 
that wants to be with him, that wants to serve him, but not about actions being perfect. That probably is the one thing I do struggle with more than anything and have consistently struggled with it as long as I can remember. Accepting the grace of God can be a difficult thing because we know how weak we are. We know so much about our own mistakes and our own failures. But that's where this once for all sacrifice of Jesus enters the picture. Once for all, he's opened the way into the throne room of heaven. Fortunately, God did not create a performance-based religious structure. There is no life in that. Verse 14 of Hebrews 10 has a couple of interesting uh, verb tenses that are there. One suggests that I'm already perfect. I am. I am perfect. I stand as perfect. Well, how could that be? I know I'm not, but by the once for all sacrifice of Jesus, God scoops me up into his arms like he does you and looks into your face and sees his perfect child without a flaw because all of those flaws have been addressed by Jesus once for all sacrifice. And yet, I know I'm not there yet. Well, verse 14 has another verb tense there. It's more of a middle tense if you're into grammar very much. That is, we are perfect, but we are being made holy. In the eyes of God, we're there, but in the flesh, we're still working on it. And that's where we are as children of God. One of the more mature things you as a child of God could recognize are those two facts. I am perfect by the once for all sacrifice of Jesus, but I'm still in process. I'm still on the way. I'm not there yet, but I'm already there. And that's this wonderful tension in Scripture that we call the now, but not yet. Already, but not quite. We are God's perfect children becoming more perfect, more holy every day that we live. How is that possible? By the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. Well, that's how I wanted to end the sermon during this response time. But I've also received several texts from you. And let's see if we can pull those up and share them. There was one that I wanted to share from last week, and it is may not be the easiest for me to find, so I'm going to try right now to find it. I thought I had it. All right, here it is. This comes from Nan Simpson. Um, because it applied more to last week's sermon than this one, I'm going to abbreviate what she said. She writes, I really struggled with religion and God and everything in general. She's attended four churches in her lifetime, and three really turned her against Christians. She felt humiliated um, in some. At one time, her baby was crying, and she was asked to leave. Um, she was treated, her family was treated as outsiders and never really felt a part of a church family. But the fourth church is Reedland. She writes this, This church, this family, has shown me what it is like to be Christians, to love one another, to not judge, and most importantly, to live like Christ and let grace shine through them. I now have a hunger to learn and to love the way the church family and does Christ, and Christ does. So Reedland has been a huge light in my darkness. So I thank Nan for sharing that last week and thought that you also might enjoy hearing that. Uh, Blair Toller responded to us. Praise God. That life isn't fair. I certainly get more than I deserve because of mercy and grace. So true of all of us. Thank you, Blair. And Marge Brillhart, all caps, shout hallelujah to the Lord. Marge, you do that and we'll listen. I think we might could hear you. We are clean. We are free. We are His forever and ever. Amazing grace indeed. So true, Marge. Thank you for sharing. 
Gene Gilliland responds, it's interesting that the commands the Hebrew writer gave us to show our proper response to Jesus once for all sacrifice for us in the let us passages of Hebrews 10, 22 through 25. So true, just a quick comment of what Gene is saying. If you'll look at that, there are several verses that say, let us, let us, let us. And these are calls to how do you respond to so great a sacrifice? So much of a rich passage there. Gene, you know that garden sermons have been based on that, the let us passages. Okay. I had to do that because you probably would do it if you got the chance. Vicki Anderson says, when I read this passage, or when I read this passage, I read stars beside this. Once for all time, once for all people, once and done. Now, Vicki likes basketball. She may be more of a baseball fan, but she likes basketball. And she's not alluding to one and done in the Kentucky way of playing basketball. Instead, she's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. One time, done, never to be repeated. Thank you, Vicki. And her daughter, Leslie. Praise be to God who knew we would not feel worthy to enter his presence and gave us a scripture to know that the blood of Jesus covers even little old me. I can know I am just as welcome into his presence as I am in my earthly father's presence. Amen. Leslie, thank you. Uh, Mike Johnson, uh, WWJD, remember a few years ago when this was a popular phrase, what would Jesus do? Let's pray for our country and our new leaders that in the first week in office are moving abortion restrictions. Okay, Mike, thank you for sharing that. And one last one from Royce Templeton. Uh, what a wonderful thought to know that we have been eternally forgiven by our Heavenly Father. He loves us that much. Praise the Lord for His forgiveness. Don and Martha did a marvelous job with the Lord's Supper. So good to see Don doing so well. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. And Gene will now uh, conclude us with a blessing from him and from the shepherds. Gene. I just wanted to speak to people because Satan has a way of getting us down. I, I really appreciated Leslie's comments, particularly spoke to me. I think of the number of people that get down on themselves and want to give up. And the Hebrew writer talks so much about not giving up and not hardening your heart. Uh, chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter uh, 3, verse 15. Uh, chapter 4, verse 7, don't give up, uh, don't harden your heart, hang in there, keep on. And that's the whole point of Terrell's sermon. The blood of Jesus is, has been provided, and it's a never-ending stream available to you if you will simply come to him and respond in faith to him. He will never turn you away. Come back to him. Look to him. Confess your sins. Let Jesus take care of them and move forward. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we pray that we will appreciate the gift of your great Son, Jesus Christ, all that he has done for us, and that we will hasten to your throne room, Father, to receive your grace and then in gratitude reach out to those around us. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.